But at any rate, man, it's great to meet you. Thank you for taking a minute out today. I appreciate it. Hey, no problem, man. It was awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get into your life as a writer, I want to know, four years ago, we were trying to figure out this whole pandemic. How long is it going to last? The ramifications? All of it. How did you survive it? And how did it change you? Well, um, survived it by, you know, just focusing on, you know, what was really important. That was family. And it was great having everybody home and, and stuff. And it just really just solidified things. You know, we were a blended family uh, and stuff. And, uh, you know, those things take like seven or eight years. Um, so luckily we were all healthy and we didn't have anybody that, that, uh, that uh, got very sick or, or we didn't lose anybody. But it was a very uh, uh, time of like congealing, you know, for our family and stuff. So that was great. Um, it changed me immensely because that's ended up why I ended up writing the book. Um, and really trying to understand what was going on in the mind of the of the modern worker um, and what how these changes in the workplace were happening. And my wife was uh, becoming a mental health counselor and she was teaching me all this stuff about the brain. And I'm watching all this stuff play out here and looking at all the different the psychology of trauma and how it makes people change, you know, the way they view relationships, the way they view decisions and signal events. So, yeah, on a a path of research and interesting well that's interesting and next thing you know i had a book uh, and i and i put it out and it and it actually did a lot better than i thought it was going to do <laughs> <laughs> so let's get to the heart and soul of what you do do right now in 2024 on a daily basis i'm going to put you in front of a bunch of grade school kids third graders it's career day and one of the kids says hey what do you do for a living how do you answer them i help leaders become better leaders so that they can grow their organizations and they can have a team of people that have good families, have a vision for their life, and everybody prospers. So when you were in that seat in the third grade, what was your dream? What did you want to be when you grew up? President of the United States. Okay. So, yeah, I was I was the state senator for a, a long time in Missouri. I ran for secretary of state. Um, I was chairman of the Missouri Public Service Commission. So I had a long political career i got to live out a lot of my uh, my dreams and dream jobs and and things of that nature but uh you know politics has a an ugly underside it's very toxic and you don't realize it while you're in the bubble and then once you get out of the bubble you start to understand and recognize how much that toxic environment seeped into your soul and into your viewpoints and the way you you viewed things um and so i had the opportunity to to be the chairman of the Missouri Public Service Commission. And it kept my toe in politics, but it was very apolitical and it allowed me to detox, you know, for several years, eight years, um, and just kind of get back to, you know, who am I, you know, what type of a, of a, of a husband and father and leader do I want to be? Um, and so it was a very healing, you know, time. It was like my wandering in the desert as I, as I call it and stuff. But, uh, but now, uh, you know, with the book and I'm, now I do a lot of executive coaching. Um, there's a lot of people that are wandering in the desert trying to figure out, you know, who they are, where are they going to go, what's the next step, and uh, and so my journey's really, you know, kind of spoken a lot to them. Plus, with all the data and the science and the stuff I've learned uh, through my wife being a mental health counselor and, and the stuff in the book we researched, it really fits nicely. So you know, before we got into this modern divisive era of politics that to me is just turned into a absolute clown show like i can't believe that it, what used to seem extreme was docile and i was watching the show house of cards and i even mm -hmm. watched veep for a little bit and i literally after that i was like i can't watch the news anymore i i i, <laughs> I can't be a part of watching this whole tragedy unfold and i understand the ideology going in and and I remember when I was younger, people were like, you should run for political office and you should do it. And I'm like, there's no way it's it's a machine that we need the ideology. We need the good change. But man, the toxicity that exists, yeah. it's, it's it unreal. Is. And it's I mean, it's it's gotten so bad. I mean, when when I was, you know, in the heat of it and it was in the state Senate, uh, you know, we would argue on the Senate floor. And at the end of the day, you know, we go have dinner together. I mean, yeah. some of my closest friends to this day are completely on the other end of the, of the uh, political spectrum than I, but we were respect each other. We were friends. We cared about each other's families. Now it's to the so point where like, you can't compromise. 
you're the enemy. Everybody's focused on their social media and it's so divisive. And then there's the, the search for purity going on in both parties where, you know, I, I could have cast 10,000 votes and 9,999 of them, you agreed with me. But that one vote, you'll yeah. never forgive me. And you, you're just trying this search for purity. It's not happening. You're seeing it on both both parties. Um, and it's just the, the environment, the money. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's yeah, I had to get, I mean, I'm so yeah. glad I got out. I, I ran for secretary of state and I lost by seven tenths of 1%. Wow. And those, those 2,334 people that, you know, didn't vote for me. I thank them every day because <laughs> man, it just, I would, I'd still be in it. I'd be in the hunt. I mean, one of my closest friends is the U S Senator now. Um, I mean, just, we would, I mean, I'd be in the hunt for it and, and, and everybody in my life would be paying for it. You saved your soul, man. You know, there, yeah. there has to be a part of you that every day wakes up saying, man, I got out, I got out alive. I did. I do. I, I, I wake up and it's just like, I'm thankful. And I, I recognize, you know, and, you know, I try to help some of the, the new ladies and men going in there um, because they're not good, bad people. It's just, right. it just, it just seeps into, to, you know, I mean, you, you work in a company that has a horrible culture. I mean, that culture is going to seep into you, even as much as you don't, you want, you say it, you know, it's bad and you think it's bad. It does. And it's just, you're around that, you know, you're, you know, you're around that much, you know, power and influence and alcohol and sex and everything. And it's just this bubble. And, uh, you know, so you mentioned house of cards, you know, people, you know, would always ask, well, how real is that? And I always say, well, they asked Bill Clinton, you know, after the first, you know, second season, how real is it? And his said, said, well, the most ridiculous thing is you would never be able to pass an education bill in one year. Out of all the stuff that happened, that was the thing he said was the most outrageous and stuff. And so if you've watched the show, it kind of lets you know that, yeah, it's, uh, there's, an, there's an underbelly there. Well, I will tell you the one thing I've learned in my life, especially being in journalism, is the jazz community are some of the nicest humans on the planet. Mm -hmm. And doing this right now, doing podcasting, celebrating brilliant people like you, putting out good in the world. I think the thing that's the problem with the political machine right now is there's so many good people that exist. There's so much common ground. We aren't as polarized. I think there's a lot of us that are going for the same things. We all want to have a level of feeling like we belong on this planet that that we feel like we're kind of in this collective kinship. And I think that the bleed at leads media just kind of gets this divisive wedge between us. But I think whenever I talk to all of these brilliant people on this platform, it's like, there's so much good going on. There's people doing really good stuff in the world. There, there, there is good people. And, and we've created a system that rewards um, different people. I mean, you, well, I go back most of the stuff that we've, creatives because of how we redistrict you know we we have built these districts that um you know you have to you, you, the primary is the is where you win and so they have to placate and feed the the base and we've drawn these districts to where there are no swing difference i mean if you look at presidential race the basically is coming down to 12 counties in the united states i mean everything else we already know where they're going to be because they're so polarized and you have to placate your base or you're not going to win your primary you know, you'll win the general. Who cares about that? So we're rewarding people that have to play to the extremes, and we're giving that that vocal minority so much more power than what they have. And the average voter is sitting there going, "Well, yeah, I mean, what are my choices?" You know, and it's and it's and it's we we we've, we've done this to ourselves. You know, you have you have had a, a wondrous setup for your life of being on the national stage, of being in politics, being in the Little League World Series and getting the chance to go to the White House. What were some indelible memories now as kind of an older guy thinking back on your life that was so concrete about that experience that led you to become who you are today? Well, yeah, I had the opportunity uh, you know, to eat dinner in the White House three times before graduating high school, um, <laughs> which is pretty darn cool when yeah. you're when, when you're, you know, you're a kid and you're sitting right next to Casper Weinberger and, and George Schultz. I mean, these are names that you know a lot of your listeners might not even recognize. Right. But, but you know, Tip O'Neill, some of those, you know, those yeah. big stalwart back in the Reagan administration. Um, you know, and it was just it was just surreal. And so obviously I got the political bug when I was very, very young. You know, my parents were never very political and and stuff, but having that opportunity and people always ask, Well, how did you get there? And like, well, 
my dad had a friend of a friend whose friend had a friend whose friend was the head chef of the White House. <laughs> and so through connections and we would come up and we would get to go in and, and do that and stuff. But that was just a, a amazing, you know, and then when you go like, I got, I got to play in two Little League World Series and you're playing with kids from all over the country and different cultures and different, you know, you, my world became bigger than where I grew up. You know, everyone we start off when we, we, we are our subdivision or our, our home or our school, and then it may be our city and then our state. I, I was exposed to a whole variety of opportunity that was out there that made the world seem like a big stage. You know, it was like you could go and you could do anything. And and, and that obviously I was attracted to, to that, uh, you know, your type of an environment and stuff, but those were huge in, impacts on me. Just that my life was, there was opportunities, things outside of my, my, my local town and, you know, to, to think big. Yeah. So was there a player that you played against or with that went on to a major league career that was stellar? And I mean, I'm sure I probably played against a couple guys. I know that there's some guys that went in into the minors um, and stuff. Uh, I mean, we played against a lot of guys from, from, you know, the Dominican and stuff, which I yeah. you know didn't get to know that, that, that well, I'm sure they were talented. I mean, they were way talented um, and, and stuff had some that went to, to the minor leagues and stuff, but, uh, but, but nobody, uh, I'm not calling anybody for tickets, let's say that, uh, when I visit. <laughs> so who's been a hero for you? You're obviously very highly driven and motivated and accomplished in your life. Who has been that motivator for you? Well, I mean, I would go back to, uh, you know, to the days of when I was younger. I mean, I just, Ronald Reagan was a great communicator. He His ability, take politics out. I mean, just, you know, whatever, if yeah. your listeners are like, oh, he didn't, no, not talking about it. I'm talking about the communicator the ability to cut through uh, barricades and walls and connect with various different people with a genuine warmth and a genuine belief that, Hey, he really kind of, he cares anybody does it with humor. Um, I mean, that's what I grew up with. That was like, you know, the leader of the, of the country, the leader of the free world. And you just saw the ease of which that he did that in community. And so I've, always strived you know to you know really focus on a, a lot on communication how you make people feel and things and just and just watched and studied really good communicators and you i just the power of the spoken word is immense if you know how to connect uh with with audiences and with people and individuals um so that was a very very big you know you know person that just kind of really shaped how I wanted to be a, a as a communicator. He was amazing. I because I'm 51, and in '86 when the shuttle uh, tragedy mm-hmm. happened, I remember that night hearing his speech, where you know these astronauts were touching um, touching the sky and that whole thing. It was probably one of the first times, politically speaking, that my kid brain processed and it went straight to the heart, and I and I got teared up. But those were the things that we got used to growing up that would Mm -hmm. comfort us. And it seems like now the train has not only gone off the rails, but it's flown (laughs) over and exploded into a ravine. (laughs) It has. It it, it definitely has. I mean, I had uh, good friends who were U.S. senators uh, during the Clinton administration, and they would walk into a meeting with Bill Clinton at the White House. And they would be like, I don't agree with this guy at all. I don't like his policies or anything. And they would go in. And they'd walk out going, that guy, you know, and they would have to catch themselves going, but wait, wait, no, 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 no. But he knew how to make people feel. And, and, and people don't remember what you say. They remember how you make them feel. And he was so good at that personal connection, you know, and stuff. And so the, you look at those are the kind of the, the, the communicators that, that, that we had. And you're right. Right now, it's just red meat raw you're you're bad you're eating it's just a it, it, you're right it's beyond the train wreck we we've wrecked the train twice blown it up and then uh buried it and pulled it back out so absolutely you know i saw bill clinton speak at the truman library in 05 mm-hmm. and when those doors opened up they introduced them it was like the entire energy particles in that room mm-hmm. just turned into something different i still remember what he talked about yeah. after all these years solar panels in new york city conserving energy just some things that were logical that could be done that would help our planet save it from things that are happening right now you know and uh yeah it it is good to have an orator that can make you feel like you 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 belong on this planet you belong in the room you know and that's rare especially these days 
you know. Yeah, and it's yeah when you can connect with people and like I I talk a lot all all around the country and and stuff and and when you can connect people you know and stuff you 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 feel that energy and then it it feeds you and then you can give it back to them and then it just becomes this 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 relationship this is like hey I'm you know I'm giving to you you're responding to me and it's just great and you and you feel the energy and and it's awesome when you can make those connections. So of all of the 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 the, the long political road that you've been on. Us as civilians see everybody in a in a certain way, and there's a, there's a, there's a certain elegance and diligence, and 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 quite frankly, there's a part of it that we don't see. But as a human being that was inside that machine, what was the thing that you liked the most about it that maybe people didn't realize? What was it? Whether it was a person that you liked running into to talk to, whether it was like something that you did that was a part of your rep repertoire that was busy every day, what is it that you miss or that you look forward to the most about serving this country? Yeah, the the ability to affect change was amazing. Um, so I was I started off in the Missouri House, hated it. Did not like being there because really there's 163 or 64 people and, and the show is run by three people. If you're not one of those three, you have no influence. And I was like, why am I giving my time away from my business and my family to do this? And I wasn't going to run again. And then I got the opportunity to go into the state Senate. But the Senate is a completely different ball game. There you had actual ability to affect change. And you started to realize that, wow, I can better and I can actually do that. And it became very empowering. And, you know, I, I did a lot with kids with developmental disabilities and and a lot of people with the autism community. And, and back when I was a senator, you know, a lot of kids were getting uh, uh, denied health insurance coverage, uh, just basic coverage because they had autism because it was a pre-existing condition, let alone they wouldn't pay for any treatments or, or therapies that have been proven to work. So we had to go and, and change, you know, the law and basically say, no, you know, parents are paying for this premiums. You're, this is a consumer uh, advocacy thing and you need to help these kids. There's proven things you need to, to, to do that. It took us two years, took on the insurance industry, a massive fight. But eventually we were able to get it passed to where they were start to cover these, you know, life altering treatments for these, for these kids. Um, you know, and you're watching this happen and you're trying to get this happening, you're building the coalition and you're starting to see uh, the people that weren't just, they're not just a voter, they're not just a name. You start to learn about their lives and learn about the struggles that they're having and how this is gonna impact them. And you start you know, tapping into that emotional roller coaster that they're on and the struggle, and then you're able to help them. And they, the law we passed is now used in all 50 states and it was a model uh, legislation. And then you're able to sit back and you're able to go, wow, we. We really did something good to help people. I mean, that is a powerful motivator wow. to to keep fighting and keep in, and, and change and, and 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 do those things. And so, the ability to actually affect people's lives in a positive way was uh, immensely uh, humbling but empowering at the same time. Wow, what an amazing story. So my son, Miles, is 19. He's on the autism spectrum, mm -hmm. and I'm very in, involved in his life from Special Olympics all the way down. So yes. I must thank you immensely because, as you very well know, therapies and wait lists and everything yep. is unreal. But, but, but we need so many people out there to be champions for this community because it's akin to the mental health crisis that we've hit post-COVID. Right. You know, right. there's a lot of people out there that need help. And those are the longest mm -hmm. lists and lines and yes. the largest squabbles with insurance companies. Yeah, it is. And uh, and I look at the big view of where did I mean, when I, I was chairman of the, uh, the insurance committee uh, in the Senate and, and where companies used to be on mental health. I mean, they wouldn't cover it. Oh, you can maybe get a couple of visits and stuff like that. To now, how many companies are actually starting to cover and paying for these things and stuff because they are recognizing the the impact of the brain mental health on physical health and for the few dollars that they can spend on you know a therapist or therapy or things of that nature it's going to save them so much money and chronic but getting them there with the data for 15 years you know was very difficult to to do but you know, at the end of the day, they are data driven. And that, and yeah. once the, the overwhelming data said you can save money. Oh, well, yeah, sure. Let's do that, you know, yeah. and stuff. But but it is it is huge. And the mental health crisis is going on in the country right now. And the tidal wave 
that is coming in the future uh, because of you know the trauma from post pandemic that you know hasn't even barely started to surface for a lot of people. Uh, mental health issues are going to be massive for families, companies, individuals, leaders as as we move forward. Yeah, it's, I almost feel like COVID's like this movie set, and we are in slow motion bringing the microphones and the cameras away from it. We have no idea the macro of what we've lived through. I mean, we are just, I mean, even from just the biological standpoint of what all of the, what, what actually getting COVID can do to your genome, all of those things, it's wild, you know, yeah. we're years and years away from it. Yeah. So, you know, COVID, the pandemic, all that, I mean, there was two things that happened. The first, it was a significant emotional event for the entire country. And, you know, significant emotional event is defined as something that is so mentally arresting that it causes you to change your values or your entire value system. And that's what we saw happen is you saw that, you know, you know, for examples, like you go to the doctor, the doctor's like, yeah, you should probably lose some weight, quit smoking, quit drinking, lay off the cheeseburgers. You ignore them for eight years until you have a minor heart attack. Then you're like, oh, I should probably quit drinking, quit smoking, lay off the cheeseburgers and exercise. But you didn't do it until you had a significant emotional event that got you out of your routine. Yeah. That's what the pandemic did. And for so many people, it became a, well, why am I doing this? Why am I driving 45 minutes to work one way for the job I can do for my kitchen table? And yep. why am I working so hard to pay for all these toys in my garage that I don't have the time, let alone the energy to use? And why am I overscheduling my kids in 17 different events? And, and so it caused this big shift. And then in the workplace, we saw that was the great resignation where 4.3 million people up and quit their jobs in one month in August of 21, you know, and people started to change their values and their change their value systems um, and what is more important. And now we're in the great disconnect, whereas, you know, the home has reasserted its dominance. You know, it's no longer, you know, especially in the younger generations, I want a career of significance. No, it's I want a life of significance and a career is a piece of that. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're seeing this big, you know, this big disconnect on stuff. But then, you know, for a lot of people, as you just said, you know, they had trauma. I mean, they lost somebody they had. Uh, I mean, so the American Psychological Association came out in December of 23 last year. And they said all their data points to that the U.S. working adult experienced a thing called collective trauma during the pandemic. And trauma changes the neural pathways in your brain. It changes how you approach decisions. It changes how you approach relationships. But a lot of times it doesn't start to rear the, uh, the symptoms and stuff for years later. You look at PTSD, guys coming back from battle, coming back from high stress environments, you know, a couple of years go by and things just aren't right. And I'm struggling with my marriage. I'm combative with my boss. And, you know, PTSD is a real thing, especially in the military and stuff. But I think there's a big PTSD wave that's coming here yeah. based off the trauma that was experienced during the pandemic. Um, not by everybody and you know, stuff, but there'll be a lot of people that just things are going to start to slowly unravel and they're not going to know why. Yeah, absolutely. So at the end of the day, everyone has a perception of you family, friends, all of your fans, everyone around you, but you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? I am a person that strives to live harmoniously. Um, I try to, you know, avoid conflict whenever it, it can be, because really the, the, there is no such thing as happiness in life. It's just the, uh, there's just the absence of conflict and stuff. So when you more, you can have a harmonious life. It's like, you know, when you have the music, when you have, you have, you have how wonderful every part of your brain, your body, your life has to be playing in balance for it to be a beautiful song. You got one part that's dominating. It's not going to sound just right. So the more harmoniously you can live by having everything in balance, including your brain, including your life, including your relationships, that's really the, the secret to happiness is that the absence of all those things being in conflict. So I want to be somebody as long as like, man, that guy is living harmoniously. And, and, and he is a, a synergetic person that can help people find that balance and get that harmony in their lives wherever things are out of balance. So at the end of the day, when you look back on your political life that you've lived, what was one of your favorite memories? My favorite memories, I would have to say. Standing on the Senate floor, being engaged in debate, having brilliant minds fire things at you 
and you had to stand there and defend your position and articulate like reason why without getting angry, without, you know, personal accusations. And you had to stand on your own beliefs and your own value system. And you had to put that your best thing forward so that other people would be convinced to, to side to side with you. And you didn't use cheap tricks. You didn't use, you know, coercion. It was, this is me. This is who I believe I am. This is what I believe. And I am confident to stand here and state this and whether or not you come with me or not, I know I did my best. And that was kind of like the most grounding, energizing thing as just having that ability to stand up and do that. Um, there was just a, a blessing. So if anyone wants to pick up the book, reach out, learn more about what you're doing, any of the good work, where can they go? Well, you can go to scottroop.com. Obviously, that's where I you know all my public speaking and uh, my professional coaching is everything is run through there. Though you can order the book through there. The book is I Quit, Winning the War for Top Talent. Um, it's a you know, dive into the modern mindset of what's going on in the modern worker and are you prepared to, you know, for the future of work. You can also get it on Amazon or Audible and iTunes. The audio book is available there. Uh, but yeah, just head on over to scottroop.com. Drop me a message. Love to know what's on your mind, what you're seeing in your company and stuff. And, uh, and if you're looking for a life of significance and how to find that harmony and balance, so you can be a better leader in your in your home and in your workplace. Yeah, I'd love to help. Scott, this has been so refreshing. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time, your service to the country. Best of luck with everything. Hey, you're a great American, and I appreciate you and what you're doing. Yes, sir. Thank you. Take